compute, yes. Okay, we're recording, Joe. We're live. Well, not live, yeah, we're live recording. So this is going to be our, our pilot episode. This will be our first uh, video podcast of 2020. And no better way to start than review the 20 lifestyle exercise and nutrition principles that is really the glue of You Evolve Buffalo and all of our, our programming, personal training, and group training. This is everything that if, if you were to follow these 20 principles, um, there would really be no reason why you wouldn't be able to succeed in whatever your body composition goal is, um, your strength goals. This kind of puts it all together. This is the cornerstone of our lean program, which is lifestyle, exercise, and nutrition. So as of right now, this is going to be uh, anybody that comes to You Evolve Buffalo, this will be your frame of reference, uh, your checklist of what you should be going through systematically on a regular basis to make sure that you are moving yourself closer towards your specific goal. If anything on this list was ever to change, we would, we would update that immediately. But Joe and I were just talking and <clears throat> up to this point, as it stands now, these 20 principles are still stand as the cornerstone of, of our fitness, lifestyle, and exercise. You know, um, new science comes out, knowledge changes, and when that does happen, we'll be the first ones to address it and, and keep it updated. These aren't set in stone, but are the most current principles that we have going into 2020. So why don't we just start with uh, the very first one on the list. And again, not everything on this list might be um, most pertinent to you and your specific goals. But if you do get stuck um, and you are not moving forward towards your goals, you, you are definitely going to want to refer back to these. And something on this list that you thought maybe wasn't pertinent to you, may actually be the one that's holding you back. So don't uh, discount any of these. The first one being a calorie is not a calorie. The source of the calories matter. And this has been something that we have been hammering home for years now. And there is a trend in the fitness and nutrition industry, I've noticed, which is actually circling around to this line of thinking, to our number one principle, which has been one of the most important principles to us, like I said, going on you know 10 plus years now. I noticed that especially in some of the circles that were normally staunch, if it fits your macros and just calorie based, everything revolves around the calorie first, they seem to be either <clears throat> bending a little bit on, on that topic, if not, you know, I'm not going to say breaking on it, but bending on it. And also bending to the fact that as a, as a fitness enthusiast gets closer to their goals, is losing, getting closer to their ideal body weight, even if it's maybe in a competitive setting like bodybuilding, that at some point they are going to have to address the source of their calories and not keep it just as simple as a basic calorie count. The easiest way to explain this, if it, is, if it was only the calories that matter, why wouldn't we all just drink Pepsi and eat donuts as long as we stayed within our calorie range and we would have optimal health and body composition? That doesn't even sound remotely logical. No, I think aside, aside from the... Um... You know, even if you wanted to take body composition out of it, um, the way you feel and the way you perform. Um, I know I just had a group this morning and we were discussing, um, you know, just people getting back into their um, healthier eating habits after the holidays. You know, I, none of us are oblivious to the fact that you kind of go a little bit um, out of the realm of where your normal is. If you, even if you're a healthy, generally healthy, healthier eater. Um, but they were even talking about how they, you know, they could feel it in their joints and they feel bloated. 
um, just from the excess sugar. So even if you took body composition out of it, um, I think the fact that your body lets you know what it does and doesn't want in your body or do, what, you know, what it doesn't want to be, to be there, you know? Um, what so the, the Pepsi and donut diet, even if you were going to be able to stick within your ideal body composition, your body might still be telling you, heck no, this is not for me. Two easy examples of this would be with the introduction of something as simple as caffeine. So if you were to have a, uh, a, a coffee beverage, you know, granted the caffeine isn't, it's not adding any calories to, to your diet, but think of the reaction that your body has to caffeine and then put that even to say like a little kid, you know, <clears throat> they're going to just based on pure body size and, and lack of tolerance more than likely, it's going to have a wickedly different reaction to drinking a glass of water as opposed to, you know, a Starbucks 16 ounce coffee. Oh yeah, they'd be hanging from the ceiling. So your body is going to react on every cell in your body is going to have a reaction to whatever you put into your body. And we can't just oversimplify things to just pure numbers. Your body isn't an abacus. It's not a calculator. It is a chemistry set. It's biology. And it's going to react differently to every different thing you put into your body. Another example is alcohol. So let's say you drank, you know, like a, a four ounce Manhattan. Yeah, it's 200 calories. But what if you had 200 calories worth of six ounce of chicken breast? Think about the difference in how you are going to mentally feel, emotionally feel from chicken breast to, you know, whiskey. It's, it's or bourbon, whatever, whatever it is. I think it's bourbon in, in the Manhattan. Uh, but think of just the re, your reaction time, like I said, your emotions, um, mental clarity, e everything. It's going to be completely different. And that doesn't even scratch the surface of what it's going to do as far as how your body is going to burn, store, and metabolize those calories. The protein in the chicken breast is going to be optimal for recovery of your muscles, ligaments, tendons, skin, hair, nails, and you're going to receive none of those benefits um, from the alcohol. If anything, the alcohol is going to be um, converted into fat through the liver. So it, a com two completely different biological reactions that you're going to get. So we can't just oversimplify and focus on calories. The source of those calories matter, which brings us to our second principle, which is eating a whole food diet is superior to processed packaged foods. Again, you can see the worm turning again, where uh, you don't hear, at least I don't seem to hear as much from the, uh, again, I'm just kind of uh, singling out the if it fits your macros crowd, where they would always be, you know, talking about what was it, pop tarts and you can eat this as long, you know, pizza and all this. It was a selling point that you can eat low quality processed food as long as it fits within your calorie range and a specific macronutrient profile. There is absolutely uh, some truth to that, but that is not optimal or necessarily ideal. It can work. But we're not looking necessarily for um, uh, the um, just getting by, doing just enough to live. <laughs> we want to thrive. And, and you will absolutely um, thrive, feel, going back to look, feeling, and performing better when you ingest more high-quality whole foods. Jill, what would you describe a whole food as? Your, um, your... Generally, single ingredients. Um, you could think about your fruits and vegetables are the first thing that come to mind. Um, the nuts and seeds, anything that's not processed. You do have to be careful with even the spices because some of them have um, preservatives in them. 
So that's something to be aware of too. Um, when you are following a whole food diet. Um, and those are some of the main things, your meats, um, some of them, especially with the ones that are processed, you'll have to be aware of the, uh, the nitrates that are in there as well. And added some of those, sugars. yep, the added sugars, the preservatives, you know, it's funny if you take a look at, and I, I use funny as in more like ironic, but if you take a look at some of the food labels, you know, things that you wouldn't even realize have added, um, the preservatives or added colors. Um, I think you posted a picture of pepperoncinis, and I didn't realize that there was the what is it the yellow six that's in the was in the pepperoncinis. Uh yes, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's six. Yeah. Yeah, the, the and yellow dye. Yeah, there's some kind of yellow dye, and they put those things in there. And you know, here I am thinking that you know it's just the pepperoncini, right? And didn't have never thought twice to look at that. And um, really, when you take a look at the um, ingredients label. Your best bet is to, if you can, stick with things that are going to be just those single ingredients. Um, and it, it can be a collection of single ingredients. Um, but a good example is like that, the RX bars. Yes. As far as like a, for a, a you know, if you want to call it like a snack or, or you know, some, a grab and go type of food. You yeah. know, it's generally three to five ingredients. It's your nuts, eggs, dates, dates. you know, yeah. whatever it is in there, but pretty basic. Um, food. I've also heard the argument that everything is processed. The minute that you, I mean, when when a cow is slaughtered, what what's the first thing it does? It goes in for sure. processing. But I'm not going to get caught up in that minutia of just because you separated the meat from the bone, you're processing it. I think everybody's smart enough to understand what we mean by processing foods. We're talking about actually taking like grains, stripping them. Uh, of all their nutrients and then trying to refortify it with powdered vitamins and turn, turning it into something, you know, something like pasta. You don't see, pasta doesn't exist in the natural world. You know, it doesn't grow off trees. It's not an apple. It's, it, it's literally a processed food, you know, yeah. cereals, things like that, breads, those are donuts, they're processed foods. Think yeah, and even when you see like refined and fortified, it means that, <laughs> that things were taken out, removed, put back in, so that way they could have some kind of value to them. Yeah, so some market value to, to yeah. sell it to you. Um, number three, there is no magic food or supplement. Unfortunately, in the business that we're in, supplements and sales of supplements are a huge part of the industry. Uh, the longer I've been doing this, the less and less supplementation that I use. I do still use some protein powder sometime. It's, it's a convenience, but I'm, under, I'm not under the illusion that it's superior to a whole food. And if right. I had the eggs and the meats, sometimes it's just convenient because I don't have to keep it refrigerated. You can take it on the go. You know, it's done with purpose. And again, Supplement means to be added to an already strong, well-rounded diet. Yeah, I think that's where some of the confusion gets um, that happens with a lot of the supplements too, is that people don't necessarily focus on the fact that of what we already talked about, that a calorie is not a calorie, and focusing on those good, whole, healthy foods. And they think that they're going to reap the benefits of a whole food nutrition plan by taking the supplement. And that's just simply not what's going to happen with that. And I think that that's um, kind of a marketing scheme. Sure. I, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not opposed to sure. supplementation as long as that it's understood by the consumer and it's explained to the consumer by the salesperson that whatever this supplement the claims of the supplement are those those properties can be acquired and achieved through a whole food diet and it's nothing more than convenience and chances are it's going to more than likely be a more because remember everything that's convenient is you there's a cost to it so it's going to be more expensive to you because you're paying for that convenience um which 
I can't think of any examples necessarily where the, the supplement would be superior to the, the whole food equivalent. And yeah. there's a lot of energy things out there. And uh, obviously, you know, the shakes and the collagens and any of your vitamins. Um, one of the, my least favorite supplements are the ketone supplements. I can yeah. see a purpose for them in a very narrow window if you were um, to use them for maybe athletic performance. But the, the, the problem with, I usually see with ketone supplements are people take them to get a ketone reading to prove to themselves that they're burning ketones. And of course, you just ingested ketones. It doesn't right. mean you're in ketosis. It doesn't right. mean you're on a ketogenic diet. So when, when these things are, are either being misrepresented or being used improperly, it's, it's oftentimes just a, a waste of money. So I don't want to crap all over every supplement, but not superior to a whole food diet and has to be used um, in conjunction uh, to, a, to a proper nutrition plan. We'll leave it at that. Um, number four, try a committed 30-day nutrition intervention. Decide if you look, feel, and perform uh, better. Minimum 30 days. Absolutely. If you, if you don't try anything for at least 30 days, it's really going to be hard to decide uh, or know if it's working well for you. Now, you, you, you might, if you're going to try something really extreme, yeah, you might right away see that, okay, I, I can't, it's, it's not working. I'm sick to my stomach. I'm bound up. I can't, and there can be, I'm breaking out whatever, especially if you are trying something like that involves supplementation, you're having an allergic reaction to something. That's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's obvious. If something that's compromising your health, then yeah, abort and, and seek the help that you need. But if you're trying something and it's just a matter of your, say you're going to try something like food tracking and it's just a pain in your butt and you're being lazy about it. Well, you can't say it didn't work if you, if you didn't try if you're going to try a ketogenic diet, but you're, you're overeating on your carbs, don't say the ketogenic, <laughs> ketogenic diet didn't work. Just admit that you weren't, you weren't able to stay compliant with it. And, right. that, and that's okay. Yeah, it that's might probably... not be the plan for you. And you move on to find something that's going to work for you. Sure. And, but it's hard, going to be hard to make a judgment on anything if you don't see it through for 30 days, at least. Yeah, you can't just throw it away because it didn't work after, after three days a week and you're not seeing all of the results that you want immediately. You have to yeah. give it a fighting chance and like an actual fighting chance. Like you said, you can't say the ketogenic diet's a great example. You can't say the ketogenic diet didn't work for you. Um, and especially, I, this is a whole other different podcast, but the ketogenic diet is, is much more intricate than I think what people generally believe it to sure. be. Um, they think that they're just following a, a low carb, high fat diet. And, and they, you know, that's like I said, a whole different um, podcast. But if you're not tracking the numbers with that, and you, you know, you have been given numbers to follow, you can't say the ketogenic diet didn't work for you if you didn't give it a wholehearted effort. Yeah. And that goes with, with anything, even anything. if you're doing an, if it fits your macros plan. Absolutely. You know, and you're not tracking your macros for 30 days yeah and you're like why didn't i lose any weight why did i gain 10 pounds yeah you you didn't track your macros and it's called if it fits your macros so right you didn't so whatever it is it's like um even if you wanted to become a vegetarian but you're still you know not following the protocols of a vegetarian diet you can't make a, a sound judgment on it right um number number five abstain or at least minimize the use of alcohol. And I don't know any nutritional protocol um, that is going to work well in the presence of excessive alcohol. Yeah, this is the one no one wants to hear, but they need to hear it. It's reality. It, yeah, it, it is. It's just, it's just reality. The, 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 <clears throat> besides the, um, the alcohol having no real nutritional value being empty calories, the bigger, the bigger, two of the bigger issues is, we'll start with the biological one, is that your body cannot burn any of its stored body fat until it burns the alcohol first. So the minute you start consuming alcohol, 
there is no body fat being stored because your, your body prioritizes running the alcohol through your liver because it recognizes it as a poison, as a toxin, and has to get rid of it. Yeah, so any opportunity that you would have just to be in a natural fat burning, it's, um, it's, it's done once you consume the alcohol because it's now being stored and it's focusing all of its, your body's focusing all of its efforts on siphoning the alcohol through. So a lot of times people, uh, if they overconsume or had it too late at night, the next morning when they wake up, their body still might be trying to process some of that alcohol. So even though you're not eating the next day where you, or overnight when you should be fasting, and that's a great opportunity for your body to be expelling a lot of that stored fat and energy, your body's not taking advantage of it. You're losing hours and hours and hours, and you can lose up to two days depending on how much alcohol you consume and how efficient your body is at burning it. Some people are just very, their livers are very inefficient at burning right. alcohol and they're just, they're hanging for days because they can't expel that out of their system. And until that's done, there's no fat burning going on. And then everything that you eat <laughs> is just going to be stored. stored. So yeah. now think of the combination. This is the classic at the end of a night of going out and having some drinks. People like to cap the night off um, with something to eat, whether it's late at night or you get home and you raid the fridge or it's the next morning and you're the trying to put the fire to... out with the greasy breakfast. And who, I mean, who doesn't like a nice big breakfast after being out the night before? You're trying to kill the hangover and all it's doing, everything you eat, everything you consume is just getting packed away into your, into your fat cells. It's, it's, a, it's a real tough combination uh, if you're dieting to try to overcome and make progress when alcohol's part of the equation. Yeah, especially if it's, if, if you're somebody who, um, even if you were to be on point with your nutrition, we'll say Sunday through Thursday, if you're going out Friday, Friday night, Saturday night, you're putting yourself already in a bit of a deficit. And I think that people forget that because it could be one day, Jill. It could be, oh, it yeah. could be Saturday night into Sunday, depending on the person. Right. Now, now some people, and this wouldn't, I wouldn't be one of these people. I wouldn't fall into this category where I wouldn't be able to do it one day a week, no. every week. So even just four times a month, mm -hmm. it would be, I would not be able to reach, I would maybe be able, I can probably maintain. Maintain, yeah. But to make progress for me, wouldn't work. My body is not that efficient. Right. Some, some people can, and some people not only can uh, just maintain, some people go backwards with just that much exposure to alcohol and throwing their, mm -hmm. their, their diet off either that day or a little bit uh, the following day. And I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but life just isn't fair. You, if yeah. you're not that person, you know, stinks to be you. I mean, it, yeah. it's unfortunate, but everybody's different. And if you know that and you learn that about yourself, then it's just a matter of choice. Yeah. You either and then, accept it and, and learn from it and work with what you got or yep. you just keep staying on the hamster wheel. Yep. It's, it's I, yeah, life's not fair. I, I get it. Um, the other thing uh, with the alcohol is just bad, bad choices. And it's, it, oh, it, it, it can easily, I mean, that's kind of like they go hand in hand with, with bad choices and not always just food, but oftentimes. That's Pandora's food. box, isn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> you, you have to know your, know yourself. And again, no judgments here. Just no. you have to be realistic with yourself. Um, number six, remove all grains from your diet, including corn and rice. So I know people are, they love their grains. Um, most of the tastiest sweets and, and baked goods and pizzas and breads and cereals and wraps and, you know, tacos and all, all I mean, it just seems like all the best foods have some form of grain in them. And, and, you know, depending on, on, on your palate, that, that may be true. And I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, who doesn't love pizza, right? I mean, it's, it's good. It's delicious. It's tasty. Yeah. But again, mm -hmm. that doesn't, 
that doesn't change the reality <laughs> that this might not be what's best for your body composition, your weight loss goals, or even your health and performance goals, everything wrapped into one. And there's reasons for that. One is that, first of all, the gluten, which is in your, in your wheat, um, which m most people don't understand that gluten is just, it's a protein that's found in wheat. It's only within the last generation or so that this, pro pro uh, this protein gluten has become problematic because of the farming practices have changed as far as how wheat has been grown. Yeah, you never heard of uh, people with gluten issues back in the 50s and the 60s, but the, they, weren't, they weren't growing the same wheat. It's called dwarf wheat now. They've actually manipulated the size of the plant, how the plant is grown, and now it's these gluten, oh my God, <laughs> gluten proteins are being developed within the plant differently than they were back then. And that we're coming to find out that people are having a hard time digesting this protein. That's really what, really what it comes down to. Is yeah, it's, it's literally mostly, tearing people's insides. It's a digestibility issue. Yeah. Uh, and that goes with, with most of your grains, including the corn. It's, it's not really digestible. It, it, your body does not break these grains down as efficiently and as effectively as say a piece of steak. It just, it's, it's not capable because it was never meant to be, uh, in my opinion, not meant to be uh, consumed as a primary food source. Even throughout history, these foods have been um, used in times of famine. It was always an animal source, a hunting um a hunting type society that these that that people thrived on and it was the gathering of the foods when they were available as supplemental foods it's almost going back to they were meant to be as supplements when there was when there was a bad hunt or just the uh the animals weren't available yeah the weather changes what's that I said the weather changes when yeah. like you said when the well, weather changes or, or you just you got outsmarted and you weren't you <laughs> didn't it, it, hunting isn't easy, <laughs> you know, it wasn't, there was probably many times where they came back, you know, empty handed or maybe not enough to feed the whole, the whole tribe, uh, so to speak. So if you had supplemental nutrition through plants, that would be a good thing. But again, supplemental, if anybody's ever gone like berry picking, it's a lot of work. And you're talking about on a farm with rows and rows and rows, not walking, you know, 50 yards to find a plant and then another 25 yards to find another, you know, uh, strawberries, you know, it wasn't when it's in the wild and they were smaller, they weren't as sweet. So they were less, they had less calories. In. And think of the, the amount of calories and energy you're expending to get this, the, this little bit, it's almost not worth it. Right. I remember going berry picking and going, Oh my God, we got to stop for lunch. Mm -hmm. it was it was you're out in the sun and you're up and down and pull, and I'm eating half of them as I'm going which you're probably not supposed to do but yeah. it's it's uh energy expensive to gather so uh not necessarily ideal but for as far as the grains it's a digestibility issue once you have uh digestibility issues that can lead to a whole host of other chronic issues mostly inflammation. So, so any, anything that ends in itis, arthritis, bronchitis, tendonitis, um, those things are all a matter of inflammation, which is usually caused by, as Jill already alluded to, a leaky gut, which you get bacteria that comes out of your digestive tract, gets into your bloodstream, oftentimes settles onto the joints. That's why you feel that achiness. It can, settle into the lungs, which gives you uh, uh, asthma and uh, could cause uh, labored breathing. So if you can stay away from foods that are going to be indigestible, then the foods that you do eat become more easily digestible and you can uptake more of the nutrients, which is going to create more energy um, and, and your body's going to be able to use those proteins and amino acids to do their jobs, to repair your body, 
as it was intended to. Also, I mean, the, the like I said too, with all of it, that bloaty feeling where you feel like your your stomach just feels like totally bloated. When you remove those grains, there's there's some other things, and it's going to vary from person to person. Um, but you remove those, and you might very well notice that you don't have that bloated feeling as much anymore, too. Sure. The well, I always use I always use a ring check. You know, oh, yeah. if my rings can slide on and off my hands. I know I'm good. If if I was to eat those foods that are highly processed and, and yeah, they get stuck at about here. Yeah, you could. That's inflammation, a lot, of, a lot of extra water retention, and that water retention in, in their defense is just the carbohydrates uh, hold a lot of water. Yeah. So it's not necessarily all inflammation. It's it's sure. water retention as well. But that um, even if you don't have that really like you don't have to have celiacs in order to, to <clears throat> have to remove the grains from your diet. Most people, whether they realize it or not, have even just a little low grade inflammation from those grains because of some, some intolerances. And they don't even realize it because they've gotten used to how it feels and that becomes their new normal. Yeah. But if you were to remove, again, go 30 days, remove it for 30 days see if there's any improvement when you reintroduce it if though if that feeling that um feeling lethargic and the inflammation and maybe that little bloat in the gut and the digestion isn't so well any of those little things those are all signals and then you might say oh i didn't realize i might have had a problem with these foods and i do better without them and then it just becomes a matter of choice another thing which which it it shouldn't get me mad because it <laughs> because i'm not the one that has to eat them but I know people that have had a lot of success um, with not only their health, but their body composition with just this one protocol of removing the grains. Yeah. And a lot of times it's helpful too, because those are primarily uh, heavy carbohydrate sources. And, and so you're getting a combination of a reduced carbohydrate diet. You're removing the inflammation and all the deleterious effects of the grains. They feel great. They look, feel, and perform better. And at some point, they start to creep back into their diet, and they choose, it, it, again, it becomes cognitive dissonance, which is they know that it's not working better for them, but they try to manage it, make excuses for it. Um, the, the, I've heard something is, I eat perfect, everything, but... Once in a while, I have da 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 da. But, right. You know, there's always that but, and that that but is the cognitive dissonance. Where yeah. okay, you especially if you've gone through this before, you know the reality, and, <clears throat> and I hate to say it, but you are gonna eventually come back around to my way of thinking, and you can see it. Everybody's starting. You will you you'll get away. Everybody does, but you're gonna have to if you want to optimize your health and nutrition. You're gonna circle back to these sure. 20 principles. Yeah, and I think um, just while we're touching on this too, because I know you mentioned about reducing your carbohydrate intake. The other problem um, with a lot of those, the wheats and grains, if you think about pasta that you mentioned, for example, the portion size that's suggested on the box and what people actually eat, it's probably generally about at least three to four times what one portion size is. For sure. A, a portion size of pasta, I think, is generally what? Maybe about the size of your fist-ish? Something like yeah, that. I mean, that's cooked. I mean, cooked and in a... Yeah, maybe three quarters of a cup to a cup. Maybe. Yeah. Nobody's right. eating that much. If they're eating it, they're going ham on it and eating like... It a mountain. Be, That's like a full meal for people. And by full meal, I mean enough carbohydrate intake to probably withstand something that a marathon runner would, would if, need to get through a race. If, if uh, growing up, if it was me, my father, and somebody else, if there was three people eating pasta, we'd have to cook two pounds. So, you know, a box of spaghetti for the three people. If it was more than just me and him, if there was a third person, it was like, all right, cook a second pound. That's how much we, in a, in a sitting. Yeah. You know, and I know, I mean, it, it, on, a, on a good day, not anymore. I, I don't think I can do it anymore. I just don't think I have the stomach capacity, but I, I, could, I could push three quarters of a pound to a pound. 
you know, of just a possible, that, it's, that's ludicrous. But this, I mean, that was a, we ate like that on a regular basis. Yeah. So I get it. I get, and that, oh, that's, I not, that's not counting the bread. I, oh, wow. Well, right? Yeah. You know, oh, so, I know. I worked at Olive Garden for about nine years. So not, again, Never not, ending past bowl. not coming from a place of judgment, coming from a place of understanding. Yeah. I, mean, I get it. Yeah, you can see. You can see. I mean, it comes in the portion sizes. You start dipping the bread in it. You got the yeah. sauce. You start throwing in an Alfredo. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> it, actually, it doesn't. It doesn't even I sound was just going to say, I'm actually not a pasta person, so I can talk about it and not even be uh, phased. Um, let's, let's move on. Um, number, number seven, remove all legumes from your diet, including uh, peanuts and peanut butter. So this, this can be, this is, sometimes people get a little confused about why we recommend this. And it's going to go back to some of the same reasons as the grains. It's mostly purely a digestibility issue um, with the peanuts. Some of the proteins in the peanuts and, uh, are very hard for people to digest. The, the, the way the peanuts, uh, again, the peanut allergies, right? Where there's more and more nut allergies. People can't tolerate um, these nuts and legumes. And there's, there's two different um, schools of thought on this. And one of them, which I never really considered until recently, is that because of, which you, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but maybe the kids can't bring the, the peanuts and the nuts to school anymore because right. kids might have allergies. Say you're throwing a birthday party, you're going to be very you know, like, okay, let's make sure that there was no, no nuts in any of the cookies or anything, because you never know who might have a peanut allergy. Um, you'll see in uh, restaurants now, you know, they have to make sure that things don't get cross-contaminated. Yeah. So because people are getting less and less exposure to the nuts, they are losing their tolerance for it. It's almost working in reverse. So because a, a child's never been exposed to it, exposed to peanut butter as a, as a small child, that they've lost, they haven't built up a tolerance toward digesting, digesting it and have a negative reaction to it. So I, I, I can kind of see that. I don't know if that's, um, maybe that's almost like getting a flu shot, like giving yourself a little bit of exposure to the flu so you become tolerant to it. But it's the same concept. You're giving yourself some exposure to these nuts in, um, in legumes, and then you can uh, build more of a tolerance to it, at least with the peanuts. I've also heard actually the opposite end of that, where um, like pregnant mothers said that they like overly consumed peanut butter or peanuts or things like that during their so pregnancy. So their kids are tolerant to it? So now their kids have, yeah, they develop some kind of allergy from that. So and I don't necessarily know exactly where it stems from, but it definitely, it gets to a point that, it, that it's so severe. The girls and I were just talking about it this morning. They can't, um, anything, if they were to bring anything in, it has to be individually packaged. And on each individual package, it has to have a full ingredients list on it. Because not only is it um, a problem when it's ingested by somebody who might have a peanut allergy, but there's some people who literally cannot be in the same room yeah. and not have some kind of reaction to it, which is, which is really scary. You know, I said to the girls, I'm like, you know, it really stinks, but think of those, that, those kids and that family and those parents, because that's a scary place for people to be, that they have to be worried that maybe I made my kid a peanut butter and jelly sandwich at their softball game, and then they go and I have it on my hands. I hand their kids, you know, just things like that. Um, but aside from the peanuts, a lot of the things... Um, there's a lot of peanut butters that have additional sugars in it. And they're also um, made with and have high fructose corn syrup in them. Sure. And, and, and going back to just the basic legumes, like what, what legumes we're talking about, all of your beans. Um, think, think of like any kind of bean, like navy beans, lima beans, um, kidney beans, black beans, red beans, whatever. Um, a lot of times people, I, I'm one of them who has, cannot digest them. Uh, whatsoever. Oh. Talk about getting gassy, bloated, um, just instantly. If I have, um, especially like uh, Mexican food, which is which is great, but if I get something with the beans on it, I'm I'm out. Dinner cup, my stomach gets rock hard and bloated. 
there's just no, there's no digesting it for me, yeah. which goes back to almost similar to the grains. Now you're going to, as you can't digest it, you're going to get some inflammation and all those other things that come along with it. And, um, it, it's less than ideal. It's your body telling you that gas and bloatiness is your body telling you it doesn't have the enzymes to break those foods down and digest them. And they can't break them down when it goes through your GI tract. It's going to, it's going to wreak havoc on it. So, I mean, just, just again, and maybe not for everyone, but be honest with yourself when you eat these foods, are you, are you better than before you ate them or are you worse off? And well, some, some people might be perfectly fine with it. And that, that's okay if you, if you are. Yeah, but how many people, I mean, I'm not even, I guess, trying to be funny, but sort of, but that whole Beans, Beans, the Magical Fruit song. I don't know that, that one. No, I think I we'll, talk, we'll talk about it later, but, yeah. you know. I think it, I get the point. Yeah, it gives people gas. I don't think that it's, I don't think that you're the exception. It seems to be that that's more of a general rule. Sure, and, and, and again, people, I think, just get, kind of just accept it. That, Used to it. Yeah. They think it's uh, the, normal. This is normal. I'm supposed yeah. to eat these foods, feel like crap, and everything that comes along with it, and that's that's okay. Yeah, it's an incredible thing, though. Once you do maybe take those 30 days like we talked about, you remove some of these things, like the grains, the legumes, and you realize how much better you are able to feel. You yeah. know, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, number... Eight, uh, yeah, number eight, avoid soy and soy products. So the biggest, for, and I usually reference, reference the men's, the, the biggest issue I have with soy be, besides I don't find it appealing or tasty or I'm just on a personal level, it just doesn't do anything for me. I, it doesn't hold any nutritional value that I couldn't get from another source of food. It's not a uh, superior source of protein to an animal product, or even, I would even prefer a protein supplement, whether in the form of whey protein or casein protein. But there is um, not, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say clear cut and dry research, but there is enough of it pointing into in the direction that it can have a negative effect on men's testosterone. And if there's even, I would say, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to try to, I was going to try to put it in the percentage terms, like say even, you know, 40% chance or uh, then I want to steer, steer away from that. Um, so we don't know ex exactly how much of an effect it has or how much you'd have to consume. I'm just going to say, I'm not taking my chances. I don't like it. I don't think it has any upside to it in my diet that I would be willing to take that chance by consuming it. Now, edamame, um, if I once in a while have a few of those with sushi, I'm, believe me, I'm not sweating it. You know, some, something like that. I don't think it's enough exposure to it. I don't think it's often enough. Um, so that I'm, I'm not necessarily concerned about, but I'm not going to be uh, eating tofu on a regular basis as a, as a, sort, as a source of protein or be using a soy protein supplement or, or anything of that nature. And that's just a matter of um, personal preference. For women, same thing. There's research showing they could have yeah, I, negative effects on, on their right. estrogen. So, and, and then again, also some digestibility issues possibly. It is one of the top five most genetically modified um, foods in America. So you also have the GMO factor working against you. Again, it's going to be more than likely highly processed. Um, so all those things have to be taken into consideration. If you, again, maybe it's not the, the top priority on your 20 list, but if you're doing everything else and, and something isn't working quite well, then you may want, it might be something you want to address. Again, might not be the low hanging fruit on the list, but definitely take it under consideration if, if all else is failing. Um, number nine, avoid industrial seed oils, corn oil, peanut oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, rice oil, bran oil, safflower oil, palm kernel oil, etc., etc., etc. These are again highly processed oils. You think about what it would take 
for you to get oil out of any one of those out of whether it's you know corn canola they're not just they're not squeezing them like grapes and making wine they're going through a highly refined refined chemical process to extract that oil and the oil that they do get out of it oftentimes does not have any of the omega threes, which are anti-inflammatory, and they most likely contain omega sixes, omega nines, and even twelves, which are pro-inflammatory. And that is the primary reason why you want to avoid those oils. Now, olive oil, on the other hand, does have a nice dose of omega three fatty acids. You can also get omega threes through other whole food sources like sardines and, and those, uh, even uh, grass-fed beef. Um, but it's definitely the, the omega-3 profiles and the oils are, are drastically different. Now, coconut oil does not have omega-3s either, but it does have MCT oil in it, which are, is um, medium, I shouldn't say MCT oil, it's MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, which is the um, medium chain, um, I just said medium chain triglycerides, which is a source of fat and also a very clean burning energy, uh, especially for brain function. So that's the case for the coconut oil, the MCTs, and for the olive oil, it's the omega-3 fatty acids. The other oils, again, have more of the inflammatory uh, omegas in them. So again, something you, you would want to avoid or at least minimize. Anything else on that, Jill? Pretty straightforward? Nope. nope, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Okay, limited dairy consumption to what you can tolerate. So this again, it goes on an individual person by person basis. The, what is usually the issue with dairy is lactose, which is just, it's a sugar. So anything that ends in toast or taste is generally a sugar carbohydrate which is oftentimes found in milk. It is removed, the lactose is removed once you get into butter. That's why most people can um, more easily digest butter without a problem, but they might not necessarily be able to drink milk. You might not be able to have ice cream because that's one of the sugars, the lactose is one of the sugars from the milk, which is in the ice cream and why it tastes so sweet, not to mention the additional sugars that are added to the, um, to the ice cream, but that's why you can't tolerate the ice cream, but you may be able to tolerate a cheese or a hard cheese where there's no carbohydrates. They, again, remove the lactose. So it's usually the lactose, which is the linchpin in the dairy. So certain dairies you might be okay on, some you may not be okay on. Um, some people just have a general intolerance to it straight across the board. Again, on a personal note, I can't do the the lactose, I don't have a problem with butter, and I'm okay with a little bit of things like cottage cheese and cream cheese, but I do have to watch the amounts. If I go overboard, um, yeah. then I, I don't feel, I, it, it becomes more of a, uh, an irritation, a mucus thing. Um, yeah, no, mine is- Inflammation. Um, yeah, mine's, um, I can have, like you said about the, I'm good with butter, um, the hard cheeses I'm all right with. I love cottage cheese, but I can only do like one portion size of it. And then my stomach starts churning. Sure. I mean, it's not even like, like you get the inflammation and the, you know, all of that. My stomach literally starts churning and I, and that's just gotta be it. There's certain, well, there's certain with, things that with, just don't. The issue that. with the cottage cheese for most people, now there is a, there is a couple of carbohydrates in it, but it's usually not the lac lactose in cottage cheese. It's, Cottage cheese is uh, a casein protein as opposed to yes. a whey protein. Yeah. And people sometimes, myself included, like, uh, has a very hard time digesting the casein protein. Yeah. Um, they do sell protein supplements that are just casein. They sell some that are just whey and some that are blended. And I can no longer do just casein protein supplements. No, Again, me neither. I, um, I remember years ago, somebody had suggested to me 
I think it might have been actually at some point when I was in my show prep because they said it would help keep me fuller longer. Mm -hmm. So they suggested the casein protein. And I think I, I spent the money on it. And it's a little bit more expensive, if I'm recalling correctly, Generally, than the yeah. way. Um, and so I splurged a little bit, got it. I think I tried it twice because the first time I thought maybe it was a fluke. And, uh, and then that was it because it just doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't break down as, as easily. It's not as easily um, digestible as a whey protein. That's why for when supplementing post-workout, they usually recommend a whey protein so your body can break down the whey and absorb it really, really fast to start the recovery process immediately yeah. after your workout. And then oftentimes they'll recommend a casein protein at night. Yeah. So while it's you're- Slower, it digests slower, right? Digest slower and that protein while you're sleeping is being bled into your system. I it would also- like it. What's that? I said it felt like it. Yeah, because it just your body has to really takes it takes a lot. It, it to, was doing a lot of work. A lot I wasn't of work. Happy about it. I would even go so far as to say that that is like old school bro science because when I'm sleeping, I I would ideally, especially if um, if I'm looking to improve body composition or weight loss, I want to be in a fasted state. Yeah. Because if my body's cons is trying to digest all night, then I'm not and break, break that protein down yeah. to store it, then guess what's not happening? You're yeah. not releasing fat from your fat cells. Yeah. So again, a case against casein. Yeah. But again, on an individual level, if there's some people that um, have not w lost um, the enzyme that, which is, um, I can't think of it off the top of my head, that breaks down the lactose. Um, I can't think of it. Um, but if you if you are able to do that, then the dairy might not be problematic for you. But again, just listen to your body. I think also too, just real quick, touching on the dairy again, cheese, hard cheese, your index finger, that's one serving. Oh, yeah. That's one ounce. If you were to take the hard cheese, going back to what we talked about, the pasta, nobody's eating just one ounce of cheese. Not that I know, at least, because if you're eating cheese, you're probably eating all the cheese. Yeah, very. Yeah, it's it's very uh, calorically dense. Mm -hmm. Now, which brings us to this. This is going to kind of dovetail nicely into number eleven, which our eleven principle is reduce overall carbohydrate consumption. So let's just put cheese on the side for a second, which is your hard cheeses are going to be mostly fat with a little bit of protein and minimal to zero carbohydrates. So by reducing overall carbohydrate consumption, why would we recommend this? So the carbohydrates, when digested, get broken down into sugars. When your body has elevated blood sugar, your body's natural response to, high, to elevated blood sugar is to release insulin. Insulin comes from the pancreas, floods the bloodstream, to attach and remove those uh, the glucose from your bloodstream, and it gives your body is given three choices of what to do or where to put and store those sugars. Anything that's not being used for instant energy, it can be stored into your liver, which we know has very is small and has limited storage capacity. It can be stored into your muscle cells which again, have limited storage capacity and would only have room for storage is if you are active, were exercising, expending energy from those muscles. So there is now vacancy for uh, more energy to be put into them. If you, are, if you have not done that or are not being active and exercising regularly, then the third choice is to be stored into your fat tissue which is how the body gains weight. It's by eating. Your body has nowhere to, is, eating in excess of the energy that you're using has no need to be stored into your muscle cells, has nowhere else to be for this energy to be put, so it goes into your fat cells. 
your fat can take on the storage of this excess nutrients indefinitely. And think of it just like a, a balloon that doesn't have uh, any, any water in it yet. And as you're putting the water in it, these, these balloons are expanding and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what's happening throughout your body with your fat cells. As you're eating, they're, they're, it's being stored and processed into your fat cells. And eventually when these balloons or fat cells reach their maximum capacity, they have the ability to split and break into two balloons. And then the other ones can start taking on more of the stored energy. And this is how you know, the body gets fat and, and larger. Yeah. So the linchpin to all of this is the consumption of the carbohydrates, which is causing the reaction of your body releasing insulin. And the insulin is the hormone, which is the driver of these nutrients into your fat tissue. So the idea is, is if you reduce the amount of carbohydrates, which is sugar, your body breaks those carbohydrates. Now, even if it's in the, the form of plant matter, your body is gonna break those carbohydrates down into sugar and your body's gonna release insulin. If you can control your insulin levels, you are going to have better control over your body weight. So if you were to eat something like the cheese that we just talked about, which is primarily fat, a little bit of protein, and minimal to zero carbohydrates, you are not going to get an acute insulin uh, release from the consumption of the cheese, the same as you would had you eaten, say, we'll go back and say a donut, which is still going to be high in fat, but it's coupled with high sugar. So the sugar releases the insulin with the donut, and then everything is going to be rapidly stored somewhere in your body where the digestion of the cheese is not going to cause that rapid insulin spike. And you are going to have a better chance of taking those calories from that cheese and the fat and the protein and either being able to use it for instant energy or your body can expel that energy through the form of heat and not store it into, into your um, adipose tissue. Yeah. You know, the real crap storm comes when you couple, now think about it, if you take a fat source, something that's really energy calorically dense, and you couple that with something that's very carbohydrate laden, so something like a, donut. a burger and fries and yeah. a Coke. Oh, yeah. Think about the combination of that. You have all the sugar from the Coke, you have all this carbohydrates and fat because the fries are deep fried. So the right. oils, the fats, and the carbohydrates, the burger, which is protein and fat, and then the carbs from the bun. You're slamming all of this in together in a, a pretty short period of time. So yeah. you're getting this rapid insulin roller coaster. Um, and really, we're, what's your body going to do with it? You're asking an awful lot. Of, of your body to try to deal with that load of carbohydrates, insulin, and fat all at once. Yeah. You know, talking about, and, and I know you've heard me tell this story a lot of times. I actually just was talking about this again this morning. Um, about nine years ago, before, before I uh, started really doing anything um, health, fitness, exercise, nutrition related, I, we, we used to eat bread bowls and drink a bottle of wine. This was like a nightly thing. And it was just, it was just a nightly thing. It wasn't a special occasion. We weren't at a, a Super Bowl party. This was like, we lived near tops, go get a bread bowl, some dill dip, a bottle of wine, maybe some ice cream. Anyways, <laughs> went to the seminar, got some knowledge, went to a um, appointment with my primary care doctor and they do the blood test and urine because I was due for a physical and I'm sitting there and my doctor at the time comes in and he goes are you following a um, like a real low carb diet and here I am I'm like yeah why should I not do it you know because yeah tell, tell, he wants to be told that I can't yeah please it's bad for me I'll go get a bread bowl right now yeah. <laughs> right now I'll, I'll stop on my way home and he goes no he goes 
um, he goes, there's ketones in your urine. He goes, and doing that ultra low carb diet that you're doing, um, he goes, that's the diet that we put pre-diabetics and diabetics on. And at that point I was like, ping. I was like, I'm not waiting to become a diabetic until you tell me that I need to change my diet. Yeah. You know? So it was just, that was really, I think my eye opener because I mean, I was, I was going in, I was on a bad path, going in a real bad direction when it comes to my health. And that was something, as soon as he said that, I was like, all right, that's it. So by, um, if, if that story alone is something that'll wake you up a little bit, if you're headed in the direction of being pre-diabetic and I'm, I'm talking type type two, uh, type two diabetes. Um, if you're headed in that direction, um, then that might be, this one might be the real, that might be your number one is this reducing your carbohydrate intake. I would suggest that first and foremost to anybody, um, for body composition, health, whatever the case. It can, the reducing of the carbohydrates and the uh, removal of the grains can almost be like a chicken and the egg scenario. Oh yeah. Chances are if you, if you lower your carbohydrates, what are all your high carbohydrate foods? All those grains are all the high carbohydrates. So you're, you're almost removing them by default. Yeah. If you remove the grains first, you are almost by default lowering your carbohydrate intake. For sure. Unless you were going to just like stuff potatoes down your throat to replace the carbohydrates, which you know, is, is possible. And you would, you would still probably negate, you would negate the, the inflammation and, um, and some of the digestibility issues of the grains, but you might not get the body composition goals you're looking for because you still haven't reduced your carbohydrates. enough. Yeah. But let's be honest, as much as, you know, I'm an Irish girl, as much as I I love potatoes, you're not going to trick me into thinking that a potato and a bread bowl taste the same. So, right. Right. It's generally a good, uh, do them both. Mm-hmm. Number 12, uh, incorporate resistance, resistance training consistently into your lifestyle. This, this is definitely, um, in the, in the top three, I think yeah, of for sure. the, the 20 core principles, especially for, for us as a gym, as trainers, uh, whether it is your body composition, it's, for you want to change your body composition, of course, we have to address your diet. But you can just diet and lose weight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the body composition changes that you want. If you do not incorporate the resistance training, you can, when you're losing weight, when you're dieting, when you're losing weight, you don't, that doesn't mean that you're just losing body fat. Yes, you're going to lose some body fat, but you could be losing all of, not all, some of the good stuff as well. The muscle, the bone, the connective tissue, tendons, ligaments. Um, you could be, you know how many people have had problems with their skin and their hair? I remember a long time ago dieting and following a low-fat diet, and my gums were bleeding. My, I, I was eating 17 grams of fat a day because that was, that's what we were told, low fat. You know, my carbohydrates, I was eating oatmeal and, you know, high carbs, low fat. Um, I was losing the weight, but man, I was, I was not healthy and I was not feeling good. I could I definitely. Yeah, losing weight. And I think that that's something that needs to be declared too. Losing weight. There are not good ways to do it. Yeah, you want to <laughs> lose fat. Not yeah, you, weight. right. Weight and I think be that, anything. Right. And that's where I think though, that people get confused about things. I mean, well, I know, I think this is later in the list talking about, um, making goals, but, um, you don't want it to, yeah, you want to make sure that you're focusing on losing fat and focusing on having a good, healthy body composition. It's not about getting down to being skinny as a rail. You want to be able to make sure that you can move and my God, lift things and have your hair stay in your head. And you want to be robust. Yeah. So. Um, when, when dieting, when people are really focusing on losing body weight, body fat, I should say, I can correct myself again. Um, I tell them because sometimes people, when they, we hear this excuse a lot too, if they don't lose weight or even if they gain weight, 
And if they're exercising, they'll say, well, I must have gained muscle, which is not the case. It's virtually never the case. Because if you're following your diet and you are eating uh, in a caloric deficit, there's just, there's no building blocks to build that muscle because you're not eating in surplus. So you're not accomplishing both things at the same time. It's, it's physically impossible. So what, so then, you know, almost the question would be beg to ask, well, then why should I even exercise at all? If I can't build muscle, why don't I just focus on my diet and lose weight? Because that's exactly what's going to happen. If you do that, you're going to lose weight, not necessarily lose fat when you're dieting. And as long as you are incorporating that resistance training, you are sending your body the signal that I'm using these muscles, I'm stimulating them, I'm activating them. Let's say you have a nice, solid, full body workout. You're using your arms, your legs, your upper body. You're pushing, you're pulling, you're squatting, you're deadlifting. All the basic motions, hip hinges, everything. You're just telling your body, I'm using this stuff. I need it. Keep it here. Keep it here. Yeah. Take the food that I am eating and partition it to those areas that I just stimulated because I just broke them down through the form of exercise and in general activity. And now they are in need of repair and um, to be refilled. Those muscle bellies need to be refilled with glycogen, which is your stored sugar, because we're going to need energy for tomorrow's workout. So your body is smart enough to realize that that's where the food and nutrients that you've ingested needs to be portioned out to, and thus you maintain your muscle composition, your bone density, and again, going back to your organs, your liver, your hair, and everything else that, that you need to take care of. And it then recognizes as your body fat is now the dispensable um, nutrient, and your body is going to release that fat from your fat tissue to be used as a form of energy. If the resistance training isn't there, your body can just start pulling energy from anywhere it deems unnecessary. And it might not necessarily just be your fat tissue. It might just be like, well, you're sitting on your butt all day. Let's atrophy those, those glute muscles in your sure. hips. And you're obviously not putting any stress. If you're just sitting around you know, maybe it's just the nature of your job that you're, 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 you know, stuck sitting a lot all day and you're very inactive. You have a sedentary job. It's just, it's just the nature of your work. Then if those thing, even your bones, so the muscles aside, when you're working out, you're not just working your muscles. Each bone has a, there's a muscle and a, a tendon connected at each end. So think of your femur, right? You have your hip and then you have your knee joint and there's tendons on both ends. When you're squatting, you are actually putting tension on both ends and you are making micro fractures into that bone. That's how your bones get stronger. Just like your muscles. You are, all your muscles, except for your tongue, are connected on both ends. When those muscles either expand or contract, that's where the damage is being done and, and hence the need for repair and hopefully eventually growth. But first things first, you try to do one thing at a time. You either prioritize losing the body fat, maintaining the muscle that you have and exposing it, or when you are satisfied with your body composition, then you can make changes to your diet where you do have the ability to increase your muscle mass and hopefully if you do it smartly, you will not be putting on uh, too much excessive fat. That's sure. the key. But you are, you're not going to um, be able to pull this off by doing just cardiovascular exercise. Yeah, I think that that's you a key point to make. I it think can't, that's a key it can't point be to done. Make. Yeah. It can't be done. Cardiovascular running, think, think, think of this, okay? Look at the, the best, look at the physiques of the best runners in the world, right? They look yeah. very thin, yeah. emaciated, um, 
very little muscle or tone on them, even their legs, unless they're like sprinters, track and field. Now that's different because that's, that's short distance. And even through longest runs are relatively short distance. You're doing 1600 meters. That's one mile, right? They're not running five K's and, you know, and they're not doing it all the time. They're training in their training regimens. I got news for you. They lift a lot of weights. Track and field athletes lift a lot of weights. They train yeah. very hard with resistance training. It's not just, they don't just do a bunch of sprints. Yeah. I know, I mean, there's a lot of, again, let's, I'm gonna pick on, I'm gonna pick on spinning a little bit. The only thing spinning is gonna be good for is learning how to pedal a bike and not move anywhere. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's, that. that's, yes, you're going to, you're going to expend some energy. You're going to sweat. It's good. You can, you know, improve your cardiovascular health, right? Yeah. If done properly, you can um, stimulate a little bit of mu some muscle activation in yeah. the legs. The hips, glutes. Yeah. But that has to be, that's <laughs> the amount it's base. It's, it would be endurance training at, at that, at that point. You're not necessarily going to be building uh, up the muscles in your legs unless you are doing a very specific program and incorporating some uh, that that machine in a way to complement your resistance training. So again, look at all look at your greatest bikers in the world. Look at, at, at a guy like Lance Armstrong when he was competing. Very slight upper body, narrow shoulders. They didn't, because they didn't want to build, they didn't, they were, they were athletes. They didn't, they wanted to be aerodynamic. They wanted to be light, right? Their bike yeah. had to be light. They had to be bike. Um, their bodies had to be light. The cardiovascular exercise is, is good for improving your cardiovascular capacity. It's not good for building your body up. Your diet is going to be what's important for either losing, maintaining, or building your weight either up, down, or maintaining, but it's going to be the resistance training, which is going to shape your body. It's going to be what makes your body stronger. You are not going to, I mean, think of all the different, I mean, it's very, very popular now, a lot of places, gyms similar to our, well, I'll call them, instead of box gyms, we'll call them boutique, uh, which we would be considered a, a boutique gym, yeah. right? It's, it's um, um, like a members only facility. It's not open to the public and we offer certain services. Well, our services are based around resistance training because we know that that is the key element to changing your body composition and getting stronger. Simple. No, there's no other form of exercise that can do that. If somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no other form of exercise to change your body composition or get stronger than resistance training, some form of resistance training. And it has to be done in a way that is going to constantly be challenging your body because your body is going to adapt to its environment and its resistances. Yeah, your body's so, smarter than, I think people don't realize that, you know, our bodies are smarter than we give it credit for. So you can't just go into anywhere and do the same thing over and over again, because it's exactly what you said. It's called, um, for those who don't know, adaptability. And your body gets used to doing those things and it's not going to change. You need to change up the rep schemes, change up the weight that you lift, um, the, the different exercises, um, implement what you're using. There's going to be a difference between curling, doing biceps curls with a dumbbell, a kettlebell, a barbell, a sandbag, cables. a plate, a cable. Yes, it's all a curl, but by changing just the implement, you could do the same reps, you can do the same weight, you can do the same tempo, you can do everything the same, but if you just change the implement, change it to a resistance band, it's going to be a new stimulus. Yep. Now, think of that. I just said Think of the different bands. You can have a resistance band with handles. You can take the handles off. You can use a TheraBand, which is a different type of band. You can use a single plate. You can use dumbbells. You can use kettlebells. You can use a barbell. You can use a different shaped barbell. 
you can use a thing of all the different shapes of, of the viral bubbles. You can use straight viral, oh, yeah. standard viral. You can use a cable station. You can change the handle on the cable station to any different shape, single arm, cambered, straight bar, rope. rope That's right. four or five more different ones. You can use a sandbag. You can, it, it, it's, it's endless. You can turn the, the kettlebell upside down, hold the, all different oh, yeah. variations. That's just one, one exercise. You have, you know, 30 different ways you can use it. That's if you did the same reps, the same sets, the same weight and the same tempo. Now take all 30 of those and just change one thing. Just change the tempo that you're doing it. You have right. a whole nother thing. Change the weight with the reps, higher weight, lower reps, lower weight, higher reps, change the tempo, slow, fast, pausing. So for anyone who is watching this and was ever wondering, there is a method to the madness and that is just a little bit of a glimpse I mean, um, you know, we, we give you these exercises and try to vary the resistance training within all of our classes. And these, this is part of the reason why is so that your body doesn't have the opportunity to adapt. We take, you know, you might be doing curls, the reps are different, the, the um, equipment's different, whatever be the case. And uh, that's just a glimpse into the method behind all of it. it and that's, that comes with experience. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. That's not like, Hey, you went to a couple classes, my friend lost some weight and now I'm going to have them train me. This is like years of experience, education, knowledge, continued ed education, you know, continuing to make sure that we're always learning and from experience, I think is the best. Absolutely. You know, when, um, yeah, yeah. It just, it's your, uh, <clears throat> It's, it, it's, it's your primary, it's going to be your primary body changer. There's no, no if, ands, or buts about it. The reason why, now listen, if you like to do, um, I, I don't care what it is, you know, if you like to spin, if you like to do cardio, if you like to, there's so many, I, I don't know, crazy, you know, classes, which out are out there in different forms of exercise, which is say a lot of different forms of movement. If you like it, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. You do you, something. You do you. Yeah. You do you. <laughs> I'll do me. But just like this, when we talked about with the supplements, you know, this is like, you, there should be a consumer warn warning. This is not going to change your body composition. This class is not going to help you get stronger. You know, not going to help you look any better. It's going to make you sweat. You're going to feel good and you're going to have fun. You're going to burn some calories. You might improve your cardiovascular capacity. There should be, you know, the disclaimers, you know, don't think that you're going to, you know, do X, Y, and Z and get A, B, and C. That's all. Make sure that you have that resistance training as your staple form of exercise. And then just like a supplement, if you want to supplement your exercise with, with other forms of exercise by all means it should be enjoyable you want to enjoy it listen we we offer um a, a, a dance class dance dance evolution i would never tell anybody don't do it no but, it's fun but but don't fool yourself and think that you're going to get this the the same body composition or strength results as you would if you were doing resistance training for sure you know, and then just realize there's a difference yeah. Before we move on, just because I know you touched on this, for anybody who is looking to tone, Jeff, very briefly, kind of in the middle of all of this, touched on it. Toning, all it is, is losing body fat and exposing the muscle that you have. Yeah, that's toning. So just so that way, you know, anyone who's, who wants to come and tone, that's what we're trying to do when we're, you know, focusing on your, your nutrition and, um, you know, losing body fat and exposing the muscle. Just wanted to throw out that terminology before we move on. Let's move on. Yep. Number 13, walk often one to five miles a day, one to seven days a week beyond your normal activity. All right, let's think about that. Walk often one to seven days a week. That basically means walk, do something. You can do it once if you do it one day a week, it's better than none. You can do up to seven days a week. Walking is not, mind you, as long as you don't have any injuries, you're a fairly healthy person. 
walking is not going to hurt you. How far should you walk? One mile to five miles. If you do more, again, probably not gonna hurt you. Just giving you some general parameters. What we're telling you to do is get out there and get your body moving. Again, it's not going, excuse me, it's supplemental, should be supplemental to your resistance training. It's also, in my opinion, it's a great form of recovery. Yeah. Because it's, very, it's a very natural movement. So if your legs are sore from doing your resistance training, it's a great way to alleviate some of that soreness, push some of the, the nutrients in the blood and uh, try to get that lactic acid out of your muscles and circulate all those nutrients and blood, like I just said. Fresh air, hopefully some sunshine. If the weather's terrible, you want to do it on a treadmill, that's fine too. Get out, walk the dog. It is a natural form of movement. And when you are walking and not, notice I'm saying walking, not running, the energy that you use to perform that walking motion, the majority of that energy is going to be pulled from fat. Your fat tissue is going to release fat to perform that exercise. When you start to elevate your heart rate, so say you pick up the speed, now you're getting into a jog or a run, your body's going to need more energy to perform that exercise. So it's going to need energy faster. It's not going to be able to pull that stored fat energy out of your fat cells quick enough to, to meet that call for energy. So the next place it's going to look for is sugar. Sugar is a faster burning source of energy. Now let's assume that you are following a sound nutrition plan you are not eating a lot of grains and you're not eating a lot of carbohydrates. So you don't have a lot of stored sugar in your blood system. You know what it's gonna break down next? It's gonna start looking for proteins and amino acids. And where's that gonna come from? Your muscle tissue, your bone, your tendons, your ligaments. And you can actually start breaking your body down in a negative way. So if you walk often, and for nice stretches of distance, not only, again, is it gonna feel good and be a, a natural recovery method, but you're going to burn body fat. Now, I, right now I'm working with uh, a client that's preparing for a body composition physique, and she loves to run. She's an, she, just, it, she likes it, it's what she likes to do. She feels good, and I get it. You get, you get a dopamine rush, you get endorphins from it, but, we have to monitor how much because she's on a specific diet. Her diet obviously has limited energy. And if we overdo it on the running, we're going to start breaking down the muscle. And we're going into a physique competition where we have to show muscle. So we can't just run, 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 run to try to lose weight because our goal is to lose fat. Right. And we're resistance training to keep our muscle and body composition and the cardio could work against us. Even though, you know, everybody thinks, oh, do cardio, do cardio. Your body could end up looking way worse from doing excessive high intensity cardio. That's why I recommend walking. Make sense? Yes? Use cardiovascular, uh, use number 14, use cardiovascular exercise to improve cardiovascular health, not as a weight loss tool. We just kind of covered that. covered that. You want to you have, you know, better circulatory system, blood flow, have better lung capacity. That's what you should ideally be using uh, your cardiovascular exercise for. But in my opinion, what works even better than that, lose a few pounds. You lose a few pounds if you have it to lose. And guess what? You have better circulation, you breathe better, you're able to perform better. So it all kind of works together. So you lose a little bit of weight, you do the resistance training to make sure that you're, that you're losing, I keep saying weight, you lose the fat, you do the resistance training to make sure you're maintaining your muscle and not just losing weight and you are losing fat. You add a little bit of cardio in there for your cardiovascular health and you become a better, uh, healthier person all the way around. 15, be proactive in pursuing improved sleep quality and duration. On the list, the most underrated factor of them all, sleep quality and duration. Nobody pays this enough attention. I can attest firsthand that when this isn't right, 
I'm off. My game is off. I, it's harder to lose weight. You get on, if you weigh yourself every day, even if, if that's not your regular routine, just as an experiment, you will notice a difference if you have five hours sleep, six hours sleep, eight hours sleep, nine hours sleep, and then factor in the quality to it. And there will be a direct, all things being equal, you know, you're following a, a, a steady diet. You're not one day doing this, one day doing that. Over a period of time, you will see a direct correlation to your body weight in regards to your sleep, not even to mention your mood and cognitive function, your energy to perform your, your exercise, yeah. your appetite is directly linked to your, the amount of sleep you have. Yeah. Get five hours of sleep, guarantee you're going to be craving carbs and you're going to be hungrier. There's so many things involved in sleep and so many things that are still not fully understood as far as a circadian rhythm, as far as how the body operates in sync to the world and its surroundings. It's all based on sleep cycles. And it's so, very direct. It's directly related to your hormones too, which absolutely. is absolutely directly and responsible for your body composition. So this is, I direct people to this, all, how's your sleep? How's your sleep? How long you would say, oh, I can't, I'm up at night. And what's everybody doing? They're on their phones. I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. They do it. Uh, YouTube, you know, whatever it is. But that doesn't change the fact that it's hurting you and it's working against you. So if you're not happy about it, you need to change it. There's no sense complaining about it. You have to put the phone away. You have to get a, a, a different um, alarm. alarm clock. You have to do something. If it's not working, you can't be in denial because what would that be? Cognitive dissonance. You are choosing to ignore the reality that surrounds you and think that you can keep doing something over and over again that is working against you. Um, number 16, adjust portion sizes based on your goals. I, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, let's say you're following a whole food diet. You want to lose weight. Um, you're nailing everything else on this list. Then it just might be a matter of you need to uh, change the portion sizes. The foods are all fine that you're doing. Everything's good, but you're just consuming too much energy in the form of these calories that your body is just constantly breaking even because you're always using the food that you're eating as your primary source of energy, never allowing you to tap into your stored energy, which is in your fat cells. So if you change the portions a little bit, you make that reduction in overall energy going into the system, then your body is going to be forced to start looking for energy elsewhere. And if everything is done properly and you're doing your resistance training, then it's going to come from your body fat and you'll lose weight and you'll look better and you'll feel better and you'll perform better. Um, uh, number 17, try intermittent fasting, 16 to 18 hours, one to seven days a week. So, right, 16 to 20 hours, I'm sorry, did I say 18? So again, similar to, to the walking. Um, this is something you can do once in a while, and it's basically just putting a gap of time. <laughs> so if you were doing a 16-hour fast, you would eat all the same foods, all the same amount of foods, but you would just shorten up your window of time that you're eating them to eight hours. So what would eight hours be? That would be <clears throat> 10 o'clock in the morning, to 6, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Pretty reasonable. So if you're used to eating maybe at 8, 7, 8 in the morning, you're just pushing off your first meal to like mid-morning, 10 o'clock. You still have your, <clears throat> your lunch. If you need a little something be between lunch and dinner, you have your snack, you have your dinner at 6 o'clock, and then you're done until the next morning. What you're basically doing is giving your body that big chunk of time to use so any energy that you're expending during that time is going to have to get pulled from stored energy within your body. Preferably, again, if you're doing all things right, coming from your, your fat tissue. When does most of these uh, metabolic processes happen? Overnight while you're sleeping. So it's <clears throat> 16 hours, and if you're sleeping eight, which goes back to the one before, getting proper sleep, now you're only talking about eight conscious hours uh, of not eating. Break yeah, well, four in the right. morning, four at night. And you got sure, and if you, if you go to bed and you're not 
if you're going, again, going back to the sleep, if you're going to bed at a semi-reasonable, and I guess reasonable, we'll say 10 p.m. for other people, 9, 10 p.m. Sure. That would be, I mean, maybe not for us, but... Yeah, say 10 to 6. I mean, yeah. People go to bed at 10, they wake up at 6, it's 8 hours. Right. So in, in somewhere in there, for the most part, I would say you eat dinner. Most people have other things to do aside from that. Cleaning their house, taking care of their kids knitting a sweater, whatever it is. There's other things that you can do. Um, and I think sometimes when people do this initially the first time, they're like, oh my God, I thought I was going to die. I assure you, you can make it. It's the first time it's like, I think that you have, if you get it out of your head and just have the understanding of, I'm eating between this time, you got all your calorie intake sure. in within, it's so... 1,800 calories, whatever you're eating, 2,000 calories, yeah, 1,500, you, whatever you're eating. Yeah, no one's dying. You'll, you'll make it. What, it. what it is, is you're just, you're, you're changing a habit. Yeah, that's exactly because, what it is. Yeah, you're just... And usually, especially that nighttime eating, I would be willing to bet nine and a half times out of 10, after dinner time, it's mindless. You're mindless eating your... And I, uh, this is something again, you know, you know that I will do it too. the popcorn in a movie or, you know, whatever you're and you're sitting on the couch or in your munching or whatever, whatever be the case, but you're not actually hungry. So I think also to kind of going and being a little bit mindful as to why you're eating. And that's something that definitely, I think, um, if anyone wants to have a discussion I'm sure that either one of us would be willing to have that as well. But being mindful as to the reason why you're eating, whether it's boredom, emotions, yada, yada, um, that's something to take into consideration too. Now, as an example, and, and, and Jill, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. And you know, the girls will make fun of me because I, there might be a spoon in the sink the next morning from like, I might take a, a scoop of peanut butter. Yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, Jeff's peanut butter spoon was in the sink. So if yeah. I get up, in the middle of the night, I have to take the dog out or something like that. Or even if you just get up and go to the bathroom. And if I have that feeling where I know, I'd be like, okay, I know I don't need this. I'm going to go down. I'm going to lay in bed. And it's going to take me 30 or 40 more minutes because I'm thinking, you know, I want to get up and have that tablespoon of peanut butter or two or whatever it is or a piece of dark chocolate or whatever it is. Sometimes I just, you know, let's just get this over with. Because if the longer I go, the chances are I might want to eat more. So I just, boom, I take it, I go to bed, you brush your teeth, whatever you got to do, and get it over with. Sometimes, to me, I factor out what's more important, me, me losing more sleep or me taking in this um, 200, 300 calories and falling back asleep and getting a sound night's sleep. Now, let me put an asterisk next to that. If I had... Um, very specific goals and and I'd have to weigh out which one is going to hinder the other then then I, I might not do that right but if you're just in a, a general you're Eight doing months. well everything's going good and you, you just might legitimately have low blood sugar wake up you know your blood sugar dropped and that might be sometimes why people when you're dieting if you're dieting hard too you could get woken up in the middle of the night I did when I was in show prep. I remember I would I could not sleep for anything. I Your couldn't body sleep. Is sending you signal. Get up, get up, get up. You gotta yeah. eat something because you haven't eaten enough or often enough. Yeah. So there's some legitimacy to that. Sure. But again, we're gonna use common sense. I think everybody knows what we're talking about and what the difference is like between getting up and you know, or like Jill said, before you go to bed and it's just ice cream and popcorn every night, the bread bowl and the bottle of wine or whatever it is. Yeah. And getting up and maybe, you know, throwing something in your, in your mouth just to shut, shut the night down. There's, there is a, there's a difference. There's definitely a difference. You have to have, uh, what, let's not be cognitively dissonant about the reality of which one you're choosing. Number 18, set goals. They do not necessarily have to be weight loss goals. This one's my favorite one, I think. Well, let it rip. Um, so... I, I was just having a conversation this morning, um, Tammy was in, 
and we were talking and she was talking to me about um, just right now, she's going to be focusing on getting back into an exercise routine. And, you know, if you focus on your exercise and making healthy choices with your food, the weight loss is going to come. It's going to happen. If you change, if you start developing healthier eating habits and get a routine with your exercise, the weight loss is going to will come, come along with it. And I think that that is something that is more important to focus on than the scale or the actual weight loss is to focus on those two things because that will come. It's the problem I've noticed with people is they start focusing so much on the weight loss and on the scale that the other things become a burden. So by setting these goals and focusing just on your overall health, you'll end up losing weight. When you focus on losing weight, you end up losing your mind. I've seen it so many times. So by setting a goal that is maybe, you know, I, I think I tossed it out in the group that I have, I'm shooting, I have 22 workouts scheduled for this month. That's my own goal. I don't expect that for to be anybody else's. Everyone can have their thing. So maybe it's your goal is that you want to make X amount of classes per week, or you want to get out and you want to walk three times during the week for 45 minutes. Um, maybe you want to start, if you can't do push-ups. maybe you want your goal to be, you know, being able to, maybe you can't do them from, even from your knees. You want to be able to do 10 push-ups in a row from your knees, and then you want to progress and do them from your toes. And I think by focusing more on those goals and those accomplishments, they're a little bit more, hmm, I don't know what the word that I'm looking for it is. I think you're able to wrap your head around it a little bit more and it's something that's a little bit will stick with you because then they become habits when you're focusing on the process and not the end game. Does that make sense? It, it does, but I, I would also throw in with that is which I, I mentioned to our group yesterday is have concrete goals. For sure. So if you want to have, you know, what we'll say, I, I want to be more consistent with my exercise. Okay. How often? Right. Give me a number. How many days a week? What's your minimum? Right. What, you define consistent. Is it three days a week? Then damn it. It's gotta be three days a week. Yeah. That's, that's like, like I said, I have 22, 22 for the month that had me broken down to, in this first week, so, so there's like four and a half weeks. So that gets me two on today and tomorrow, and then five for the remaining weeks. So I have five days planned that I have exercise scheduled. And I stopped actually referring to this just actually within the last couple of days. I stopped referring to planning it and scheduling it as if it was a doctor's appointment and started talking about it more being as if it was an important business meeting. Because I think that that, I, this might sound crazy, but I think that that holds higher priority for most people sure. than a doctor's appointment. Sure, nobody wants to go to, it's like going to the Nobody doctor. wants to go to the doctor. Yeah. But everybody, if you have, if you are in a position and you have a business meeting, you better be there, right? Sure. So by setting, like you said, those concrete goals of, all right, I'm gonna be exercising three times this, I'm gonna be exercising three times a week. Boom, 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 write it in your planner, sign up for your class, whatever it is. But then, like I said, either way, then that ends up working towards maybe what that, those other goals are. Even if you do, do choose a weight loss goal, there's a lot of different ways you can go about that too. And I think um, one, of, one of the goals that people oftentimes leave out of their, their weight loss goals is say like, for instance, our lean program is, is going to run for eight weeks. So say your goal is, let's just say it's eight pounds. Eight pounds in eight weeks, I'm a huge fan. Fantastic. Family. How about eight pounds in eight weeks and keep it off? Yeah. Rather than I want to do 16 pounds in eight weeks. Because what's more likely going to happen? Get They're rid of those eight. eight. Yeah. Keep That's more than likely, you know, it's probably going to knock you down. In, so if you're, you know, 206 pounds, it's going to knock you down into the 190s. Right. Then it, your goal should be to not go back into the 200s. Regroup and then decide for yourself if you want to continue down that path. All right, let's get out of the 90s and let's get into the 80s. But 
in order to keep your first goal, you cannot retrace back to the 200s. Otherwise, you didn't, you didn't accomplish your goal. Right. That, that's, that's, that's some of, that's some of um, not that I'm, I'm always excited for people, for them, when they are able to hit those milestones, those like the milestones where they're out of the twos, they're out of the whatever, the, by 10, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm actually more thrilled when I see that they stayed there, especially through maybe a summer or a holiday season Why and that they were there? able to maintain. One of the girls that um, has been working with me, she got out of the twos and she has stayed within in like well out of it. So she stayed between um, like 89 and maybe like 95, but she's been able to stay there. And that's what her goal was, was to be able to live, learn to live her life and maintain it that without going backwards. And I think that's, that's incredible because the, I think sometimes the maintenance for people, that's where it starts to get a little bit dicey. I don't know the, the, the losing is difficult, but I also think that the maintenance can be difficult for people along the way too, especially if it's been a series of yo-yo dieting, they've gone back and forth, they've done something dramatic where they've lost, you know, that the, the challenges, the 20 pounds in six weeks, and then all of a sudden six weeks is over and their 25 pounds are back on. Yeah. You, you, you have, it has to be, uh, and this is, um, you know, uh, I hear a lot of um, nutrition and uh, fitness people, I heard them say, and I tend to agree, the best plan is the one that you can stick with. For sure. Even if it doesn't necessarily fit into our, you know, 20 principles here, if it's something that you can maintain and sustain, sustain yeah. you know, even if it's some of these factors, but, you know, you have to... Um, compromise on others but it's sustainable for you then then that's the best plan for you at that time yeah. and then maybe down the road you can you know uh, uh, make improvements if if it's even needed right but sustainability um which is going to bring us to number 19 be consistent and have conviction so consistency over time equals success yeah, I don't think there's not enough ways that we could drive that one home. Yeah. Eight, if you do eight weeks on and then you go eight weeks off, you might end up worse than when you started, you know, the first eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Or you just, you know, the, the back and forth is, again, I'd much rather, like Jill, like Jill just said, I'd much rather have somebody lose eight pounds in eight weeks and not retrace rather than lose 25 pounds in eight weeks and then six months from now, it's all back on. Doesn't, and then some. That's not consistent. No. That's and not it's not consistent. good for your body. I mean, there's that's a whole other conversation too, but it's not good for your body. Physically, psychologically, emotionally, it's 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 not it's not good at all. No. Having conviction is the other half of that sentence. Be consistent and have conviction, which goes back to setting goals, not being wishy-washy, deciding on what you want from your body from your life. Remember, this is, this is all, this is all you got. You know, you're contained in, in this body. Think of it, you know, what makes me um, almost envious of something like, like a, like a, a dog. It needs nothing. It, it doesn't, it doesn't need clothes. It doesn't need shoes. The only thing it has is a collar and a leash generally that we put it, put on it. Otherwise, I mean, you, you, you've seen our dog. It's a scavenger. It, it can, if you're walking and there's food on the ground, boom, it can snatch it. it, it it's, it's, its instincts are, are finely sharpened and tuned. It knows intuitively, well, now, this is all animals, especially wild animals. Can't say domesticated animals, but all wild animals never eat in excess to where it becomes a disadvantage to them. You know what I mean? Like a bird is never going to get so fat that it can't fly. And then it becomes uh, more of an animal of, of, you know, it's prey, more yeah. susceptible to, to, to its, to being prey. Um, you're not going to see a lion get so, you know, excessively fat that it's not going to be able to chase down its prey. Right. 
it knows, you know, and a, a bear will put on weight because it knows it needs it because it's going into hibernation. Yeah, you know, that's it, that's when it will because its in, instincts kick kick in. It survives, and, that's, and it's all yeah. self-contained within. And I think too often we get, you know, the little shiny thing over here, and we start pursuing things that are counterproductive to us as 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 a whole, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So, put your you have to you know, put your sword in the sand and have conviction about what you want from this body, this life, this, <clears throat> your health, your, uh, and how you look, feel, and perform. We'll just keep it to that. Yeah, and, and with that too, I mean, that's all per the individual. What I that's want, right. what Jeff wants, what any of anyone in this program, it's very well might not be the same thing. No. And that's okay. So it doesn't have to be, you don't it doesn't have to be, have to be a comparison. We're not the status or you know. Uh, yeah, you know, this is Mr. this Olympia. is not us saying that you have <laughs> so to have similar goals or our goals. You have to, but you do have to. Like you said, you don't have to lift my weights, but you have to lift yours. You don't have to have our goals, but you do need to have your own and stick to some kind of stick to a plan when you're, you know, following along or following through with that. And then that leads us to number 20, have purpose, Woo! ideal hands do the work of the devil, which we've kind of covered where Jill talked about the, <clears throat> the, the snacking, the mindless snacking at night. That's the idle hands, you know, the, uh, the mindless time suck and drain on social media. People, I think more and more people are realizing now the negative effects that the social media has on people emotionally, people seeing the highlight reels, seeing Instagram influencers and um, people setting these um, maybe lofty body composition expectations. You're not getting the whole story that <clears throat> maybe these people with these great physiques are really miserable and what it takes for them to maintain this is really having negative impact. <laughs> on, on, what's up? I said, of course they are, because, you know, a lot of these people, when they're, especially when it comes to the physique, I would, there are some people who live and are okay with it, living in that constant dieting, but we've both done it. Yeah, it even, even, even the ones that, 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 that are doing that, and I have friends that do, but Again, it's it's a much it's a it's it's portrayed one way out this way. But when you know them and you talk to them, and they, you know, and 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 we have conversations yeah. amongst ourselves, and they're telling me, "Oh my God, my, my family can't stand me." I'm oh yeah, every, I driving. I, I'm not throwing out names, but I I saw somebody who is a very avid competitor, and they recently just put out this huge post that they're thrilled to basically be taking at least a short off season or, or whatever um, because they're living out of Tupperware or eating out of Tupperware, going to parties, not enjoying or and not wanting to be social because I know when I was, when I was dieting for those shows, I had no wants. I remember my, it was, um, oh God, it must've been Aubrey's birthday. So I competed in March. Aubrey's birthday is the end of January. We had a birthday party for her. My mother sat down next to me because we got pizza and wings. We, they, I ate out of a Tupperware container. My mother sat down next to me. I go, get away from me right now. Oh my God, I was miserable. I was nasty. She goes, are you kidding me? I go, yeah, no, I'm not kidding you. Because it, it's just, it was all well and good. Looked great on stage, but the process and the and getting there it ain't fun. No, so, so, so the highlight reel that people get in social media, you, you don't know what goes on, you know, behind the closed doors. You don't know what these, um, maybe they're physique competitors. You don't know what they're going through. You don't, you don't, you don't know, know the, the drugs forbid. that they're taking. Yes. The amount that, of, of performance enhancers and Oh God, and don't even get started on that. It's a whole other story. So and not only that, but you know, some of these people that put out that they their their body composition some i mean eating disorders the psychological issues the list goes on so 
by taking a step back from at least the social media and kind of stepping back into reality of real life, I think is. What, and, and what I mean by the devil is everybody's their own devil. Sure. You know, idle hands do the work of the devil. And that, that's all, that's up here. Or over here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with, within yourself. Is, sure. Is, is what I mean. And, yeah. And everybody has to deal with that. They have to deal with themselves differently. Um, you have to live, you have to live in, in this, in this skin. So you have to know the difference between say you're using the mindless social media to just distract yourself from, from reality. Yeah. And in, 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 I mean, basically that, that is the primary purpose of what people use it for. It's just, it's a fantasy outlet. Uh, but if you're using that and you're not, and, and the house is crumbling around you, that, that's not good. You know, your body and your health is going to hell because you're spending your, your time in this fantasy energy stuff when you should be working on yourself. I think some of the best things that we've done in the past were when we did that, um, like a social media, remember when we did it, I think it was for a week, a few years ago, we did like a social media, I don't want to call it a detox, but we basically yeah. dropped social media for, for seven days. And, um, you know, People, you and I have had conversations, not even regarding the social media, but just in general, take the opportunity to be just with yourself and acknowledge some of the things, maybe your behaviors um, and, and whatever else along the way and kind of take notes and um, see maybe where some, some positive adjustments can be made. Sure. Go for the low hanging fruit. All the easy stuff first. For Put sure. order into your life and everything will follow. Well, that covers the 20, Jill. I would say that's, that's plenty. It's definitely yeah, I long think enough. so. All right. So that's going to be our, uh, our first podcast of 2020. We'll see you guys next week. 2020 and 20. Okay. That should, all right, I'm going to hit the end, end the meeting. I'll give you a call, Jill.